Good morning. I'm Father Mark. I'm curate here for Children, Youth, and Family Ministries, and I want to welcome you to St. Philip's in the Hills. If it's your first time here, if it's your first time in a long time, if you're joining us on live stream, um, or if you've been a member here for a while, I want to welcome you to this place, this community that is gathered in love, transformed by grace, and sent to serve. Um, if that sounds like the sort of community that you want to um, that you want to grow roots into, I hope that you will talk to me. I hope that you'll talk to somebody around you and ask them how it is that God meets them in this community, because um, you'll be prepare yourself to hear some pretty wonderful and surprising and amazing things. This is a community that is filled with the Holy Spirit, and we are very glad that you're here. A couple uh, brief announcements before we begin. Uh, tomorrow, uh, you may know this thing, it's called uh, Meet God at the Movies. It's a particular program where people uh, watch a particular film and then meet um, at a particular day, on a day, at a particular time, on Zoom, to talk about said film. Tomorrow is that particular day and that particular time. So uh, the 21st of June, Monday at 6.30 on Zoom, uh, there will be a conversation of the film uh, Nomad Land. So if you are interested, you can find information on the, uh, in the Bell and Tower and on the website for how to join that Zoom meeting. Um, and it would probably be a good idea to, uh, to watch the movie beforehand and then join the conversation. Or, or you could just do, like sometimes people do that at book clubs, right? It's like, oh yeah, I, of course I read it, yeah. Love this book. Um, second announcement. Um, Wednesday, the 24th at 5.30 is our game night. Our in-person game night is uh, starting up again. So uh, you might have known that game night was a thing that we had online for our youth um, through most of the year, in fact, uh, just after the pandemic began. Um, and we're now moving into in-person, which is fantastic. So we'll meet in the, uh, the children's courtyard um, we'll stay outside as much as we can because we can relax a bit more, but we'll have a little bit of food, we'll have some games, and if it gets a little too hot, we can move indoors and do the distancing and the masking and stuff like that. But um, nonetheless, 5.30, Wednesday, 24 June, Children's Courtyard, game night, board games. Who doesn't like board games? I love board games. Um, and final announcement, uh, and this is just an informational thing. If you... Um, it, you may have noticed, you may have read in the Bell and Tower that the vestry is going to be reevaluating some of our COVID protocols um, about worship and about community life and about space and all these other things. So um, I just want to announce that and let you know that that is uh, a thing that's happening. Uh, be on the lookout for, for word from the vestry about how our protocols may be changing in the next couple weeks or even the next couple months. Um, if you want more information about anything that I've talked about, you can probably find it on the website or in the Bell and Tower. If you're not a subscriber, you can subscribe on the website. Um, if you desire more information, if you want to have a conversation about anything that's going on here, if you want to make your confession, if you have pastoral care issues, talk to me, talk to uh, one of the other clergy here. Um, talk to the community. We're, we're, we're here for you, and you are most welcome here. Let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, let us adore him.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, you all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Make us have a perpetual love and reverence for your holy name. For you never fail to help and govern those whom you have set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Job. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, and I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched a line upon it? On what were its faces sunk? Or who had laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and the thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall I come, and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. As we work together with Christ, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, At an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in, in, in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But, as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. I don't know if you heard this sort of loud noise that was out here, and I thought, how many places other than Arizona do you think, is that a rattlesnake about to disrupt my sermon? But there you go. Um, Speaking of of sort of unique to Arizona, this this last week, our our air conditioning has been out uh, in our house which has been uh, delightful, uh, as you can imagine. If you believe that suffering produces redemption, we are well on our way to the better place. But uh, so, you know, we've been waiting, sort of looking up to God and saying, do you not care that we are perishing? There you go. 
But I, so we were sort of relieved. We have this long drive to go pick up Nicholas from Chapel Rock, from the camp in Prescott. Uh, so it's about four hours there and four hours back. So it's eight hours of air conditioning. Delightful. Uh, and so what, what my, my custom on these sorts of trips is that I make a, a, a long list of podcasts to listen to. Uh, and they're usually things that the whole family enjoys, like things on economics, philosophy, public <laughs> policy. So on, on this one, uh, I decided, uh, let me find science things, because my wife is a scientist, so I thought we'll find these science things. So I, there was one that, I, that caught my attention as we were going, uh, and it was one on CRISPR technology. Have, have any of you heard of this? Some of you have. It's, it's something I'd heard about, but I don't think I really quite understood what it was, and I still don't really, but I'll pretend I do for the sake of a sermon. Um, so the way that, that, it, that an article defined CRISPR technology it says CRISPR is a technology that can be used to edit genes as such will likely change the world. So it can edit your genetic material. Uh, the essence is simple. It's a way of finding a specific bit of DNA inside a cell. And after that, the next step uh, using this CRISPR gene editing is usually to alter that piece of DNA with the idea that you'll, you'll get rid of something that is causing illness or something that you might pass on to another generation. So, and of course, a technology like that puts us at the doorstep, seemingly, of, of solving some of the most vexing and debilitating and deadly diseases and conditions that we face and have faced throughout history. It's kind of an incredible thing to think about, that we can just edit away sort of genetic things we don't want to have around anymore or we don't want our kids to get, right? I mean, think about that. It has the potential to transform medicine and we might even decide to use it to change the genomes of our children and their children uh, to maybe improve them a little bit, not just get rid of, of stuff we don't like, but add more stuff we like, right? Um, and it's being used for lots of other purposes. And in some ways it would redirect or enable humans to redirect evolution. That's an incredible thing to think is suddenly landing in our hands. Now, I don't know about you, but the way we've handled the pandemic for the last year and a half does not make me confident that this should be in our hands, frankly. <laughs> but the lecturer was talking about this, the promise of this technology. I mean, there is a massive amount of suffering that can be ended if this is used appropriately. The promise is huge, almost unbelievable. And of course, with us being human, the potential downsides and dangers are huge too. What does it mean for us to be able to edit our own genetic code? What does it mean for questions of diversity? Who's desirable? What traits are desirable in our society? We're not great at answering those questions. And who will have access to it? Would it be only the wealthy who would have access to it? I don't know if you've ever played this game where someone says, what time period would you want to live in, right? So most of us say something, oh, I want to live in the Middle Ages because I would be some sort of lord in the Middle Ages and I'd have a vast tract of land. No, most of us would be a serf and we would die at 25 of a tooth decay, right? <laughs> like we, so when you think about a technology like this, who would have access to it only probably the way our economy works now, the top sliver of people could afford something like this. I mean, think about the, this new Alzheimer's medicine that we don't even know if it works, $50,000 a dose. Unbelievable. So who would have access to something like this? So, I mean, so if, you, if you're wealthy, think about this, you could buy a sort of healthy, uniformly agreed to be attractive, uh, super talented, super baby. So your baby would be one that people would look at and say, oh, that's cute and talented. And then a sort of cast of super babies is conceivable with the vast rest of humanity dealing with the diseases and infirmities that they leave behind. There are these huge moral and ethical issues, and, but there are subtler ones too. It's about more than just what makes for a, a healthy human. I think there are questions about what makes our character strong resilient, compassionate, and so much more. One of the interview subjects talking about CRISPR uh, was someone who had sickle cell anemia. So he was told that his genetic code could be edited 
to ensure that his children and his children's children would not suffer from sickle cell anemia. And at first he was elated. Of course he didn't want his kids to have this thing with which he had struggled his whole life. Who wants their kids to struggle? But then he came back and his tone changed and he said, I think that I would like to figure out how to leave it up to them. Why? Asked the doctor. You would seem so excited about it. Why have you changed your mind? And he replied that sickle cell anemia had taught him perseverance. It had taught him compassion. It had helped him learn how to deal with struggles in his life and to overcome them and not to take so much in his life for granted. It was a significant force in shaping his character, and he wasn't thinking about creating a super baby. He was thinking about having a child who would learn to overcome that which the world imagines is a barrier. He wanted his child's character to be strong. Through that kind of struggle in our life, and all of us struggle with something or another, it can be possible were it to be transformed into something holy and life-giving if we let it, if we let God hold on to it and take it and make it new. And through it, we can come to trust not only in our capacity to achieve something, to overcome some struggle, but to trust in God, to trust in other people along the way who will help us, upon whom we will rely at some point in our lives. And we come to trust that we don't need to be in control for things to be under control. We come to trust the diversity of our gifts and to see weaknesses as potential strengths too. We come to trust that no matter people's seeming limitations, they have something to share too. And we come to trust that God loves us through the struggles. And we come to trust our compassion and our longing to help others in struggling too. So, when I hear about something like this technology, my concern is not for the, the sort of physical traits that might be edited or deleted. My concern is for what it will edit or delete or destroy in our character, in who we are, how we care for one another. In the Old Testament, we hear God speak out of the whirlwind. From the noise and from the seeming chaos, God asks a series of questions and puts our relationship with our Creator into perspective. You know, sometimes people will say, well, I don't know if God is exactly like a parent. When you hear these questions, he sounds like a parent. Who are you to ask me? I paid for this house. I paid for that refrigerator and that food. <laughs> but he tells us in that conversation what he has shaped, what he has formed, what he has edited. His questions take our aspiration to make a more perfect humanity and sets them alongside the simple fact that we are made in the image of God. Yes, in our infirmities and illnesses and more, we are created in the image of a God who planted the foundations of the world, whose Son comes to take our flesh upon himself. And in the church, none of our members say uh, to each other, we don't look around and say, well, who can we edit out? Who can we make more useful? How can we make someone less of a burden? There are so many times in the life of communities, nations, individuals, when we will look toward the whirlwind, toward the challenges and heartbreaks and struggles of our life and wish them away. We will want nothing more than a certain numbness to set in, in the face of pain and ache. And our hearts and our minds will spin and turn and tumble and be roiled and tossed and wrecked. And then as lightning deafens and thunder blinds us and the wind pins us down, then we hear Christ saying, peace, peace. The word implies an absence of struggle, but that's not what it is at all. It's the moment after the struggle. It's the moment when we take stock of what just happened. I don't know about you, I've been sort of feeling in a national way after this pandemic and election and the racial sort of upheavals of the last year and a half, that we need peace, we need a pause to take stock of what's happening and figure out what is this struggle making of us? How can it make something holy of us? And not just wish it away, not just wish we were numb to it all, 
but let it transform us and our nation and our communities into something more holy, something more compassionate, something able to reach beyond the struggles and move and stretch towards something holier. I mean, the, the story reminds us, these struggles remind us of the resurrection story in, in which Jesus is not a kind of, you know, a, a, a butterfly. He doesn't go from caterpillar to chrysalis to flight. He goes down to the grave and dies and comes back to life. Peace, peace was the stone rolled away after the struggle. Peace was the transformation of that trial into something life-giving, life-saving, and holy. And peace was the struggle to make possible a new compassion, a new mercy, a new forgiveness, a new love. And I suppose as I was listening to that story about CRISPR and the genetic tailoring, the uplift of our species and the super babies to come, I pondered what, what is it that we're going to lose in all of this? I fear that we're going to lose struggle. We're going to lose the compassion that comes with it, the sense of needing to care for one another, the sense of needing to rely on God. You know, when Jesus shows up in this miracle today and he's stilling the waters, imagine this miracle. The waters were quite calm, and then Jesus stood up and calmed them some more. That's not a terribly exciting miracle, is it? He doesn't sort of show up to feed the 5,000, and they say, oh, there were 5,000 people that were all quite full, and he gave them more food. Jesus shows up in our deepest need, our deepest hunger, the times when we feel most out of control, and says, peace, take, eat. What we mean when we say Jesus was fully human is that he struggled with us, and that struggle made him human. We say he was truly human because he wept. We mean that he thirsted. We mean that he nursed. We mean that he suffered. We mean that he died when we say he was fully human. So I wonder, I think the struggles of the gospel point towards something deeper. They point toward a need for trust, a need for the belief that we can be healed and be part of the healing of one another. And it's a healing that's deeper than just what's on the surface. If our lives had all the struggle edited out of them, what would they be? What would be left? How would you have learned to love, to trust, to care, to be patient, to be generous? without the struggles that give shape to the shortness of our days. And I don't think, don't hear this wrong, I don't think God makes us suffer to somehow improve our character. But I do think God stands with us through them, walks through them with us, and through the valley of the shadow of death is standing there pointing to the other side and saying, it is through the valley we will walk together. It was not just the seas that were calmed in the gospel today was the hearts and souls of those who feared what was to come and couldn't bring themselves to trust in the one who called the expanse of creation into being. So how do we, perhaps feeling like we have nothing, come to realize that we possess everything? How do we, who feel so tossed about, come to realize that the one who holds us in his hand is not going to let us go? And how can we find peace through these struggles with our very, very blessed and broken and fragile and resilient and perfectly imperfect humanity. Amen.
Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He is spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Jennifer, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God, or a deeper knowledge of Him. Pray that they may find and be found by Him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask your thanksgiving for the indigenous peoples of this and every land, and especially for the Tohono O'odham and Pasquayaki tribes who have cared for this land from generation to generation. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. We give thanks for fathers. We give, we give thanks, thanks for those fathers who have striven to balance the commands of children with the unforgiveness of both joy and sacrifice. We give thanks for those fathers who like the hands of God in order to become good fathers. We give thanks for those fathers who prepare our own parents, not only their children, but who continue to offer. 
Almighty God, his blessed Son before his passion, prayed for his disciples that they might be one as you and he are one. Grant that your church, being bound together in love and obedience to you, may be united in one body by the one Spirit, that the world may believe in him whom you have sent, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have not done. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have never truly been sorry and do not want to repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. God, have mercy on you, give you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. Oh, no. 
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory and love which you have made known to us in creation, and the calling of Israel to be your people, and your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where, with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. Philip, our patron, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be pleased. Gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us the spiritual food, the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. The Eucharist has ended. The service begins. Go in peace to love and serve. Thanks be to God.